Can everyone hear me? Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the second session in this room today. This is it's Thursday. You're at LCA. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're now going to hear from Matthew Trinish, who's a developer advocate at IBM. And like many people here, if you're from Sydney, you might live in an apartment that's way too hot. And uh, Matthew's going to tell us about his hot apartment and how that led him to a classic kind of hacker open source moment. So please welcome Matthew. So thanks for the introduction. So um, I came home from a recent trip, and it was the middle of a heat wave. It was about 40 degrees outside, which is a heat wave for where I live. Um, and I had all the windows closed, and I came home from this long trip, and it was completely unlivable in the apartment. I had to leave because I couldn't tolerate it. Um, and, I, and I was thinking to myself, I have to do something to fix this. Um, but the problem is, I live in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, this is a pretty typical snowstorm from last year. Um, that guy's having a really bad day in the back who's lying down face forward. Um, and this is the weather extreme we have to deal with in Poughkeepsie. It's not like Sydney where it's routinely in the mid 40s because it's not a tropical climate. Um, and because of that, my apartment is not designed with cooling in mind at all. This is the room layout for my apartment complex's website. Um, that's my furniture is not where that is. And there's normally only one person in there. Um, I, I just annotated it with the red marks at the bottom, which are the two in-wall AC units that are provided to me with my rent. Um, and that is the only cooling besides a couple of windows, which you can't actually see. Um, there's one in the kitchen, two in the bedroom, and two in the living room. Uh, and the windows are actually over the AC units, so it doesn't really do much. Um, and this is it. And it's not designed for cooling in mind at all. To make it even worse, these are the AC units they give me. Um, they're pretty old, horribly inefficient, really loud, and give you no level of control except for that rotary selection knob, which lets you turn it on low cool, high cool, which is fan speed and the compressor on, and then low fan and high fan, which is the fan on without the compressor. And then there's also that knob which says temperature and has a blue bar with no numbers and I have no idea what it means. I assume it's the compressor speed, but I actually have no way of verifying that. And this is the only active cooling in my entire apartment. And I realized I just need a thermostat. This is a solved problem, but this unit does not have a thermostat. So I decided to build one. Before I could build one, I had to figure out, well, what is a thermostat? At its most basic level, it's a closed loop control device with one input, a temperature sensor, and one output, some mechanism of controlling the device that's doing the cooling or the heating if you're trying to heat up your apartment, which I'm not. I really wasn't. <laughs> um, and with that, I just needed to figure out, OK, how am I going to sense the temperature and how am I going to control the AC? Sensing temperature is a solved problem. You can buy temperature sensors from anywhere. So I concentrated on starting with the harder problem first controlling the AC. So looking back at this unit, the first problem was there is no identifying information on this unit at all. The only thing on it is that little GE logo in the corner under the control knobs. Um, I checked the GE website. They said there's going to be a serial number either on the right or left side or under the front cover. There's nothing on the right or left side, so I decided to try to yank the front cover off, and I pulled the AC unit out of the window. That was a really bad day. <laughs> Um, turns out they don't actually support it in there. It's just hanging there by gravity. Um, so I put it back in, and I said, OK, I'm not going to be able to find any identifying information. I, my first inclination was, OK, the control circuitry, take it apart, run some wires in. It's a rotary selection knob. I can just wire up a microcontroller and switch it on or off. But I don't actually own this unit owned by my apartment complex. And I think when I moved out, they'd be pretty unhappy to see wires sticking out of it going into a microcontroller board. So I ruled that out. Um, my next idea was oh, I can make a cool robotic arm, and it'll twist the knob. But I travel a lot for work, and I don't have time to play with robotics. And also, when that goes wrong, I don't want to know what happens. Um, so I gave up on that idea. And I decided I could just control the power. I can leave it on and just cut the power at the wall. And then that'll let me turn it on or off. It won't give me the same level of control of twisting the knob or interfacing with the electronics directly. But it'll at least let me control it to a certain degree. 
Um, and an additional constraint is given where this is in the apartment, I don't want to be running wires from this end of the apartment to the other. So why, some form of wireless power relay would be ideal. Turns out this idea isn't unique. Um, you can, there are commercial solutions out there, um, and they're all pretty terrible. Um, these are two that I pulled off of Amazon and then found the manufacturers. They, come, they all come straight out of Shenzhen. Um, the one on the right is actually popular with home brewers because it has a remote um, temperature sensor that you can you know, put in. It's sealed and you can put it in a tank or whatever. Um, but they're all terrible because the interface is push buttons and it's that little LCD and that's all you have to do, which means every time I want to adjust the temperature or turn it on, I have to get up, go down to the power outlet, figure out how I, if I can read the LCD. It's a big mess. And the one on the left is particularly bad because that thing that looks like an antenna, that's the temperature sensor. And if I'm plugging it in on the wall right next to the AC unit, you're going to get the heat from the compressor. It's, it, I don't understand who would buy these. I mean, they're dirt cheap. The one on the left was like 30 bucks, and that one's like 20. Um, so I guess if you don't know any better, but yeah. So I wasn't going to deal with these terrible solutions. I ended up buying one of these. Um, this is a Z-Wave power relay. Um, I had to measure the power consumption of the AC unit with a clamp meter to verify that the 15 amp, 15 amp rating on this was enough. Um, that was actually a pretty difficult thing to figure out. Um, but it's enough because the AC unit at peak draws 13 amps, which is still like crazy for something like that. But um, I bought one of these. Um, for people who aren't familiar with what Z-Wave is, it's a low power mesh network similar to something like Zigbee. Um, the difference is this is licensed by a company called Sigma Designs. They make the silicon and came up with all the RF protocols and the software protocols. Um, and it's not really open, and that really bugs me. But the thing that I really like is the interoperability testing. They, because they're a commercial solution and they control the licensing, they can test that all the devices work together. I've played a lot with Zigbee in my life, and they never, it never works the way you expect it to. And I didn't want to be spending all of my time fiddling with uh, Zigbee intercommunication with devices. So I ended up getting one of these and compromising my principles a little bit. Um, but it turns out there's, some, there's a lot of open source support for using these devices. Um, open Z-Wave is a fairly mature C++ library for interfacing with Z-Wave networks. And they also have Python and Lua bindings and probably some other languages I can't remember. Um, one thing to note is I assume for commercial reasons, they use different frequency bands in different regions. So they're not compatible if you buy in the US and bring them to Australia with Australian made devi devices for the Australian market and vice versa. Um, since they're all in the same ISM band, which is pretty much global, um, that it, they don't really. Uh, yes? So this is not commercial, it's an unfortunate uh, Australian start with 950. Okay. But the US starts at 900 on. Okay. And a lot of these things are made at 900 on before Australia. Okay, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so for the uh, recording, his comment was in Australia, the ISM band starts at 915. And in the rest of the world, it mostly starts at 900. So it's not actually a commercial thing. It's just a peculiarity with different regulations between countries. OK. Um, moving on, um, since I was starting the Z-Wave network, I decided, oh, I'll just buy a wireless temperature sensor and leverage this fancy new Z-Wave network I'm putting together. And I bought this thing, which is a multi-sensor 6. Um, it includes a bunch of different sensors, including a light sensor, humidity sensor, UV. It says it has a seismic sensor, but I assume it's just an accelerometer and it's measuring how much things move around. Um, I use it for temperature. Um, it's kind of overkill, but it's wireless and I can place it in the room where I want. So I bought one of these for the temperature in my apartment, put it on the Z-Wave network, and then I bought one of these little USB controllers, stuck it into the computer I was going to be running things on. And I had a nice network with a C++ and, and prefer, for me, a Python API where I could control the switches and read the temperature. And that's, you know, great. I could write software that will be a thermostat. Um, and then I got lazy. And I have a lot of friends who play with the project Home Assistant, which is a home automation platform written in Python that supports a ton of components. Every time I look, it goes up by like 100. When I first started this, there were 400 components. And I started this project in late 2016. And now they support over 900 different things in this home automation platform. Um, the key thing for me, though, was everything runs locally. Um, for everyone who's seen home automation things, the popular thing is, oh, we'll just throw the control in the cloud. Um, Nest Thermostat, for example. And they have 
great uh, horror stories when network goes down in the cloud and then you don't have heat and people start freezing. Um, so it was very important for me that everything runs locally and I control all of the data and all of the communication of both my metrics at home and also all of the control is local. Um, and an interesting thing that I thought was cool in the community is they design it to always work on a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, you can run it on bigger hardware, but they want to make sure that no matter what, if you don't have that much hardware, you can always put it on Raspberry Pi 3. Um, in practice, Home Assistant is pretty straightforward. It's just a hub in the center of your system, and you can put it, pull in heterogeneous components for your, that are in your home to do whatever. And whether that relies on a vendor cloud service or talking to a device directly or some kind of IoT bridge device that are popular for some things. Um, and it just all goes to Home Assistant, and then you have a central location for controlling all of these different classes of devices. And the architecture is pretty simple. It's basically just a unified event bus, and it lets everything keep be, uh, be modular and not have knowledge about everything else in the system. You just have an API for something like a light, and then you write a little module that talks to whatever light device you have, and then that just sets and consumes events from a unified event bus using the standard API, and then you have automation rules, which can also trigger off that same event bus and push to different classes of devices. And it lets you keep everything modular and small. Um, and that same methodology translated to how they maintain the community. Um, another aspect of Home Assistant that I really like is the way they interface with devices is only using external Python libraries. So if you want to, you know, let's say, uh, an example from my experience is I use the CMUSE um, NCURSES-based music player at home. I wanted to have control of that in my home automation system for reasons I can't remember, and I don't use it because it was a terrible idea. But um, I wrote a little Python library to interface with the CMUSE NCURSES-based music player, um, and then I used that in Home Assistant. They wouldn't have accepted the code if it was just talking to CMUSE directly. They wanted a library in between, and that helps the overall Python ecosystem. I have, that library is very surprising that people actually want to do this thing, but they contribute back to it because they want to control this music player with Python and not because of Home Assistant because putting an NCURSES based music player in a home automation system is a terrible idea. Um, so it, I was very happy with this system. And I'm like, okay, great. Now I have an automation platform. I've got a switch, I've got a temperature sensor. I can write a thermostat in automation rules because it provides you this rich DSL in YAML um, to write automation rules. So I said, okay, I'm going to write rules for a thermostat. And this rule right here says when the temperature is below 25 degrees Celsius, turn the switch off. The, AC, the apartment's cold enough, it's time to turn the AC off. And this kind of worked, but it had a lot of problems. Um, the first is I have to write a rule for every conceivable condition um, a lot of rules, um, especially because I've got two different AC units that I'm controlling. Um, the rules are also only triggered on state updates. So if something goes wrong, um, it, gets, it gets stuck. Um, and the switching becomes unreliable when that happens. The thing that was the real killer, though, is if I ever want to change the temperature that I'm setting the, the um, AC to, I have to modify the YAML code, commit it to my Git repository, push it up to the server, and then the rule will be checked when I reload the configuration file. Which is not the best model if I want it a little bit colder in my apartment because for whatever reason. So this didn't work. Turns out though, Home Assistant had a concept of a thermostat, a thermostat device. Um, and even better yet, when I, when I was looking at all of these components, most of them require some kind of hardware like NAST or a Honeywell thermostat or some other thing. Um, when I was looking at this, it turns out there was already a component doing what I was doing, but without automation rules, just natively in Home Assistant. It's a little confusing though, back then, it's now called generic thermostat, but back then it was called heat control um, because it was designed for space heaters. Um, that, you know, it was the same code, just I wanted the device to cool, not heat. So I pushed up a patch to Home Assistant and added a AC mode config flag, which just flips the if statements. And then I had a heat controller device, which has now been renamed to generic thermostat because it also controls AC, that would cool down my apartment. 
And the configuration was pretty simple. I just said, OK, here's my heater, because it's an AC unit. <laughs> um, the sensor that's going to be monitoring things, um, just some bounds so it knows like if it's below 20 degrees or above 35, something's wrong, um, what the default target temperature is. And then it's AC mode, so it's actually going to be cooling, so it's not running full blast when it's too cold because it's trying to heat the apartment up. And this was great. I got what I wanted. I had a very nice software interface, a web interface, both on a browser and in the phone that let me set a set temperature, let me monitor the temperature, see when things are on or off, and control things both remotely and locally, and make sure my apartment was cool when I wasn't there. But it wasn't without problems. The first is this. So the, the red bar, this is the picture from earlier, but I annotated it. So those rectangles are the same size. One of them is the size of my bedroom. The other is quite clearly not the same air mass that it's trying to cool in the rest of the apartment. I only had one temperature sensor, which meant that when the bedroom got much colder because the temperature sensor was in the living room and it was basing the switching on and off based on that. What's worse is I actually have more zones in my apartment. I have a lot of hardware in my closet that heats that up. Um, so I didn't want, I wanted to monitor those temperatures differently. While I don't have active cooling in the data closet, I do have a lot of temp I have a lot of heat generating devices in there. So I wanted to make sure that I could monitor those rooms independently. And I didn't want to buy more uh, Z-Wave hardware because it's expensive. Um, for just reference, this is a small sample of what's in my data closet, although you can also see formal wear in the background that I don't really wear. Um, so I decided that I needed something cheaper um, because I needed two independent temperature zones. So I ended up Googling around and finding that these Dallas one-wire temperature sensors are very popular with Raspberry Pis, which was also great for me because in college we did a little playing around with Dallas one-wire. Um, so I bought, one of the, bought two of those um, for the you know, very expensive price of 50 cents each. Um, and I wired them up to a spare ras Raspberry Pi that was sitting on top of my network switch. Um, and it enabled me to track the temperatures different, uh, between the different rooms very easily. Um, the problem was there was no software to do this. Um, well, I'm sure there actually is, are plenty of examples because it's a common use case. But for mine, I decided to write a small little Python framework for, push, for pull, pulling local sensors, or any sensors really, um, and just pushing that data over MQTT so Home Assistant could read that sensor data. Um, I, wrote it, I called it Dallas MQTT because it was for a Dallas one-wire temperature sensor, but I wrote the framework to be generic for any kind of sensor that just for poles. So it has a, con, an, an, a uh, YAML configuration syntax that lets you define sensor types and how to pull them and then what to push them on MQTT with. And this worked nicely. And I was able to measure the temperature difference between my data closet and my bedroom. Um, and that spike, I guess that's around uh, 2 p.m., is when I turned that, cl that cluster on in the little lack table. And you can see how quickly it spikes up compared to the bedroom. And then when it starts going down, that's when I turned the AC on. And you can see the cycling. Um, and this, work, this works great, and I'm very happy with it. The next problem I had was something that most people don't even think about, or at least I didn't until I started playing with this, um, and it's cycle time. Um, turns out air conditioner compressors don't like to be turned on and off like a child playing with a light switch. <laughs> um, and I was burning my compressor out. It was starting to smell. Um, and this is a very typical software bug. I said, OK, when it's 25 degrees, turn the AC off. And it did exactly that. It cooled it down to 25, turned it off. Had a, heated up a little bit, the next event loop went by, cool, started cooling it down again. This meant the AC was on for like eight minutes and off for four minutes at a time. This is basically a child going like this with the um, air con. I, I'm, I don't own the AC, so I don't actually care if I burn it out. I'll just say your crappy AC burned out on me. Give me a new one, please. Um, but I, it'd probably be better if I just um, made it last a little longer. The other thing is doing this also causes a lot of um, excess energy consumption because compressors are more efficient as they're running and reach steady state. Um, so even if I didn't, don't care if I burned out this AC unit, it's probably better for my power bill and the environment if I'm not doing this. Um, so 
To fix this, I introduced a concept to the Home Assistant heat controller and now generic thermostat called min cycle time, which is a config flag that lets you specify amount of time to wait. And I set it to 20 minutes, and now it's waiting exactly 20 minutes for both the bedroom and the living room. And you can see this adjusted curve, which is really ugly looking. And I think there's missing data somewhere, but uh, it fixed the problem with the inefficiency in the aircon. Um, the problem I'm having now is, since I don't have any identifying information on this air conditioning unit, I don't actually know what its efficiency curve is on the compressor. So I have to guess. And 20 minutes was a, the best guess I could come up with. And there's probably some tweaking where I can, because you want it to be less, because you can see as time goes on, it gets colder and colder, which means I'm running the AC more than I need to be. Um, there's some tweaking I can do, but without a data sheet for this air conditioner, it's still hard for me to properly optimize it. Um, so that's a future item that I'm going to work on. But at least this solved the immediate concern of burning my apartment down. But then I could take it a step further. I've got this aircon plugged into a fairly powerful automation platform. What more could I do with it now that I've solved the big issues I was facing? Um, so I started writing some automation rules. The first one I did was fairly standard that most you know, commercial off-the-shelf thermostats let you do is a basic time schedule. You, know, you can set set points throughout the day to adjust the temperature. Um, the, this is what most thermostats let you do. So I said, okay, I can do this in software, which basically, this is an example rule from that set, which says after 12.30 a.m., so it's you know, time for bed, and before 9.30, which is, I'm probably not awake by then, but even if I was, um, set the temperature to 30 degrees in the living room because I'm probably in bed and I don't need the AC on in the living room. But I don't want it to get too hot because then there's gradient issues in the apartment. It's, but there was even more I could do. I carry at least three computing devices that are connected to the network on me at all times um, because that's just who I am. And they all have GPS chips in them. I could use that to write some really cool rules based for cooling my apartment based on where I am. Like I could set the temperature higher when I'm not home. And I can cool the apartment when I'm heading home so I never have to worry about it being too hot and me sweating because I'm lazy. And luckily there's a package called OwnTrax which did exactly what I was looking for. It pushes your location over MQTT to any MQTT broker. It's open source and it runs on iOS and Android. Um, and it served exactly what I was looking for, and it also has native Home Assistant support. Um, and this is just a screenshot from the app, um, not my app, it's just from the documentation, because I don't have five people in my household spread across Europe and in South Carolina. Um, but this was great, and it let me write automation rules based on location. The, my favorite example is this one. Um, I work from home, and so I sometimes see other people. I go work from Starbucks for a few hours during the day. Um, this rule says when I leave Starbucks on Route 9, wait five minutes, and then set the temperature to 26. The wait five minutes is based on my average commute time to get home from that Starbucks on Route 9 back to my apartment and the time it takes to cool the apartment down. So this way, as soon as I leave that Starbucks, it knows exactly when to cool the apartment down so it's the right temperature when I get inside the door, which is great. Then I wrote some other rules because there are all sorts of things you can plug into Home Assistant. The first is, if it's below 22 degrees outside, don't turn the AC on, turn it off. Pretty self-explanatory. I've never seen a thermostat, uh, maybe the Nest does it, but I've never seen a thermostat that pulls the outside temperature data and tells you you don't want to run the AC, it's too cold outside, open a window. Um, the next step for this rule is to add notifications so it actually tells me to open a window. Um, right now I just have to guess. Um, or even more um, advanced, the compressor is quite loud in my living room. I watch TV in my living room. If I'm watching TV and the AC turns on, increase the volume. Pretty straightforward, but I think this is really cool. It also freaks people out. <laughs> um, and this, this platform gives me the flexibility to do this. 
And this is one that I added recently. Um, so that, that cluster in my data closet um, is an OpenStack cloud that I wrote, uh, that I put together um, earlier last year. And it's named AutoCumulus. But it generates a lot of heat because they're nine-year-old Dell R610s and they're not very power efficient and they just dump heat in that data closet. And I really need the AC running if, um, if that cloud is on. So I wrote a rule that says when the cloud turns from off to on and is on for two minutes because there's a bug in wake on LAN and, well, it's not actually a bug. You issue the wake on LAN command and then it takes like two minutes for, or it takes more than two minutes for the device to power up. So there's a flip, there's a switch. So I have to say when the machine is on for two minutes continuously, then turn the AC on because you don't want this thing heating up your apartment like crazy. This is pretty cool to see in action too. Um, unfortunately, I can't really take a video of this kind of thing because it's really boring. <laughs> I think it's cool, but a video of me watching the servers turn on, then turning and waiting for the AC to turn on like 10 minutes later, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. And the thing that this has taught me, this whole project, is that you can do home automation sanely and securely and it's a lot of fun. And I really need more sensors and I need more automation. I just need more hardware because I've got the bug. I need to start building and playing. Um, I was, prior to this project, I was very hesitant to get involved in home automation because I read all of these news articles about cloud security and a few months before this project, there was a very high profile nest outage and living in New York, people were actually freezing in their apartments and houses and had to flee because of a cloud outage, um, which made, which just like, why would I ever want to play with this stuff? It's terrible. And then I found Home Assistant and figured out I could do everything on premises, I control it all. And if it ever goes out, that probably means the power went out in my apartment or the networking went out and that's, I won't be there anyway, if there's no networking or no power. Um, so you can do this, you can do it reliably, safely, securely, all, on your own, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm probably way too fast because I get really excited during this talk. Um, but here's a bunch of information, including a blog post, a link to the slides, and a very interesting paper for people who want to learn about um, heat pump and air conditioner cycle times and efficiency curves with them because I had to research this to figure out how to best optimize it. And the only research was actually done in the 80s because back then, um, solid state electronics were getting cheap enough that people were selling short cycle modules for their air conditioners and heat pumps um, and saying, it's on less, it's going to save you money. And these guys wrote a paper saying that's bullshit. Uh, so with that, I think I have plenty of time for questions, um, if anyone has questions. Cool. Firstly, let's thank Matthew. Cool, is this on? Can people hear me? Um, do we have any questions up here? Um, so for the TV, um, let me go back to that automation rule. Uh, for the T, oh, the question was, what kind of sensors did I use for the TV and the um, the cloud the cloud monitoring? Um, so for the TV, um, you can see I'm actually monitoring the Onkyo AV receiver that I um, so it's checking that and sending the volume to the AV receiver, and that's using that's an Onkyo AV receiver that actually is network connected and opens up, if I remember correctly, it's just a direct socket and it's sending basically the RS-232 commands over a, over a socket on the network. And there's a module that someone else wrote in a Python library for interfacing with that. So Home Assistant is just listening to that. For the cloud server, um, I'm using the wake on LAN component, which sends the wake on LAN command to the device to turn it on. To turn it off, it SSHs into it and runs the shutdown command. And then for monitoring the state, it just I believe it's a ping, a ping, periodic ping poll, um, but it's kind of hacking it together to do it that way. Uh, any more questions? Question down the front. Um, so the question is, have I looked at using the PID algorithm for this application? And the what answer is, is a PID algorithm. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a. Uh, Thank you. Um, a proportional integral 
derivative um, um, from the crowd for the recording. Um, so I have looked at that, and the problem is the nature of the device I'm controlling. A uh, PID algorithm will uh, error correct and start switching faster to try to match the curve that you're setting it to. Um, for this air conditioner, I can't do that because it's on off, and I need to make sure it's on for the efficiency curve. I'm sure if I had more details on the compressor and the spec, I'd come up with a better algorithm to control it. Not necessarily a PID algorithm, but some compromise. But since I don't have any specs, this is the best I can come up with. Some more questions? Uh, there's a couple over here. Over here, yeah, yeah. Uh, behind you? Um, so the question was, um, have I, can, are these methods um, or similar methods usable for controlling um, other air conditioning units that either have hand controls or IR controls? Um, so I know for a fact that people are using a very similar setup with a software thermostat and home assistant with IR controls. Um, you have to have an IR module and some method of sending the IR command, but in home assistant, um, let me go back to this slide. Um, that heater argument is just a generic switch device. So you could come up, you could just make a switch in Home Assistant that is sending an IR command to turn the thing on. Um, and I know people are using this because there's actually a discussion right now in the Home Assistant community on a patch trying to adjust the generic thermostat for some guy who has this very convoluted IR control system that's both a heater and a cooler, and he wants to change the entire workflow of it. Um, so people are doing more advanced things with ACs that have better control. Um, I can show you some examples probably after the talk if you'd like to see. Yeah, in front. Uh, you don't need to heat your apartment? Like, you showed snow, so it obviously gets really cold there. Uh, so the question was, I don't, uh, do I need to heat my apartment? Um, the answer to that is, so while they don't care about cooling in my apartment, they very much care about heating it. And it's also free. Um, and it has a mercury-based thermostat. Um, and I haven't seen one of those. That's a separate, so it's, a separate it's, a, it's a completely separate system. It's baseboard uh, heat, so it pipes very hot water into the, perifer uh, the perimeter of my apartment. And um, because it's shared between my apartment and the apartment below me, and we each have individual thermostat control, I don't need to control that. Um, it'd be nice if I could automate it and plug it into the same system, but because I don't own it and I really don't want to mess with uh, a Mercury thermostat, I'm not going to, I can just set it and leave it. It's also free for me, so I don't care if it's, I'm wasting a little of electricity. Cool. Any more questions? Um, uh, so the question is, is manual intervention still an option for this? Um, um, and the answer is yes. Um, because the relays I'm using are networked and can phone home, Home Assistant knows what their state is and can compensate for that. Um, and th basically that's it. But uh, the internet outage example doesn't actually apply because it all runs locally on my local network and my local Z-Wave network. Um, so if the internet goes out, I'm fine. Um, but if I do need to, um, for example, one thing I do sometimes is I leave the AC on in the software, but I'll turn the dial um, so it doesn't actually switch. And that's actually the state it's in now because in the winter, the apartment complex puts a, metal, a sheet of metal in front of the AC compressor intake. Um, so you can't actually run it in the winter. I have it turned off in software, but just in case there's a software bug or something, I turn the dials to off manually. So even if it's flipping the power, it's not going to turn on. So the question is, is my home assistant on the net and can I control it from here? Um, and he's got an evil grin in his face. 
Uh, and it is accessible from the internet, but not on an open port. I have to tunnel into my home network to access it. Um, the MQTT server I use for um, own tracks is on a public port um, on my, at my house, but it's secured through um, a TLS port, and it requires client-side TLS certs to even be able to connect to it. Um, Yeah. But the whole thing is I'm scared, you know, that uh, someone's going to do nasty things. Does yeah. that concern you at all? So the question is, does um, someone gaining access and doing nasty things to my AC concern me at all? And the answer is yes, it does, which is why I was trying to take a security conscious mind and not actually opening up a port to the outside internet. And when I do, I make sure it's properly secured with client-based, client uh, public key-based and client-based um, authentication to make sure that only I can get access to it. Um, so it is a concern of mine, and that's why most of the stuff I do doesn't actually touch the outside network. The only thing that does is actually my phone for own track saying, I'm in Australia now, set the temperature to 30 degrees C, even though it's probably about minus 10 out. <laughs> um, and that really reminds me of Karen's talk yesterday and the importance of free software in a world where we're putting computers in our bodies and our bodies in computers. Yeah. Um, you've clearly got quite a bit of experience with the whole home automation world now. What do you think that, where is free software in that world and how accessible is it to consumers, like rather than, or you know, people rather than like, you know, who aren't hackers? Um, so I think it's getting better. Um, when home automation and Internet of Things first started, I think it was just people trying to make a quick buck. Oh, I can put an ESP and, you know, a light bulb and put it on the Internet and someone can flip it on and off. Um, for example, Home Assistant is a relatively young project. It's, I think, two or maybe two and a half years old at this point. Um, and it's getting better and more accessible. Something I've seen with it is it's very developer-focused. I mean, all the configuration is in YAML, which is great for me. But for someone who wants to take control and ownership with free and open source software of their home automation because they understand the risk, but they're not a developer or software-minded, they have a hard time with this. Um, for a friend, I set up a home assistant at his house, and he gave up on it because he couldn't deal with that. And that's something like the home assistant community in particular is trying to get much better about. They're working on doing more configuration through a web interface, trying to make it more friendly. Um, but as the state of the, in the, I'm not sure the right word to describe it, but the, the industry right now is it's, it's, it's hard unless you know what you're looking for to get something that's the right, the right way. Any more questions? One back there. Kathy? Hi, Nancy. Yep. Um, so the question is, um, I solved it for my one small 720 square foot apartment in a suburb in Poughkeepsie, New York, which Poughkeepsie, New York, part of a larger complex with 300 units. Um, how do we scale this out for everyone? Um, the answer, I, I haven't even thought of that. Um, I think the first thing would be talking to my apartment complex about how terrible, terribly inefficient every aspect of the apartment complex and construction is and how we can improve that. But I don't think they'd take that very well, because I'm, I'm pretty sure they're in it for the easy dollar. This building was built in, like I think, the early 60s. It's never been renovated. When, they, when laws changed in New York State to say that apartments have to have air conditioning um, of a certain class, they literally cut a hole in the wall to put those in-wall AC units. They were not there originally. You can see the rough cut marks. Well, at least I was able to when I pulled it out of the wall by accident. So I think. It'd be an uphill fight. Um, it's either that or legislative um, force, that, because the only way to, that made them install AC in the first place, just for safety, um, was to force them to by law. Uh,
Okay. So the, the question was, um, how well does the Z-Wave um, network scale and how, many, how big can it get? And the answer to that is actually very well. I've not had a single issue with Z-Wave dropping out on me. Um, it's also a mesh network, which means as long as two nodes in the network can talk to each other, it'll work its way back to whatever thing it's trying to talk to, in my case, the controller. But um, it, can, it can grow pretty well as long as there's something in the middle to keep the, keep the communication lines open. I don't know the actual range on the devices because my apartment's fairly small. But I know, for example, the 80-year-old woman who lives in the apartment below me, if she was technically minded and wanted to set up a Z-Wave network and connect it to mine, it would have no problem just going through. And um, even if like one corner of her apartment isn't reachable, it would go through the intermediate devices. And that's part of what um, the network bring up step does, is it actually calculates how to optimize that mesh for signal strength. No problem. Any more? No? Well, thank you so much, Matthew. That was really fantastic. Yeah. And And LCA has a lovely gift for you. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. Um, we're a little bit early, so I think go out and, and have a good time. Thanks so much for coming.